Scarves, in Lord Foster's testament to all that is great about technology in Formula One, there couldn't be a better place really than to ask you about the next era of Formula One and what we're going to see. And the first thing I think to, to talk about is the renderings we've seen so far versus the published regulations. How much, how much synergy is there between the two? It, it, it's a, a bit of both actually. I mean, also with the concept cars that we saw launch back at Silverstone, what you're seeing there is the FIA's glossy idea of what the regulations will produce in terms of a car. So the regulations are published, they're public, they're available on FIA.com. Uh, the teams will have looked at them, but what you have to realise is between those renderings and those show cars is that is almost like a, a graphic designer's idea of what those regulations would, or a stylist's idea of what those regulations would shape like. That's not what an engineer would make of them. It's certainly not what an F1 engineer would make of them because um, they would be far more aggressive in areas of the design, they'd be far more left field in areas of design and there's some aspects of those show cars that we've seen that physically are, you know, are missing. There's no DRS pod, there's no adjustable front wing, rear wing, lots of details that you could possibly have around the floor edge simply aren't there on these show cars. So take them with a pinch of salt, generally that's what the cars will look like but there'll be a lot more detail and a lot more variety on those cars than we've seen so far. So let's put to rest then, and, and that's encouraging to hear you say that, the stories that Adrian Newey is very frustrated by the regulations because there is so little he can do. You don't think that's the case. You think in reality probably there's still quite a lot that an Adrian Newey can do. From, uh, from a fan perspective, there's a lot the teams can do that will make each of the cars look different to each other. Um, so that's a good thing, and that's what we like to be able to differentiate the nose shape, side pod shape from car to car. From an engineer's point of view, that those areas aren't the same. So when Adrian Yu is getting upset, he's worried about the volume in which the front wing end plates can go in, the volume in which the side pods, and particularly the shape of the underfloor, and equally some of the like these front, front um, wheel fins and the rear brake duct fins uh, are either prescribed or strictly limited in which way you can shape and position bodywork. So for him, it's a huge frustration. And, if he's trying to go, or if any aero designer is trying to go a certain direction with managing the airflow through the car, if the allowed geometry that the FAA have given you to work within doesn't work, then you're snookered. You have to find another solution. And from what I've spoken to various aerodynamicists and people within the sport is, you think you've got something worked out, and then you reread the regulations and you look at the data and you can't do what you would expect to do. So there is going to be a frustration from the engineer side of things. I think that will get worked out as the years move on. But in a nutshell though, you saying it's the end of the high rate versus low rate cars, it's not possible to have that sort of extreme anymore? Um, there's, well, there's two things going on uh, in terms of high rake, low rake. At the moment, you have long wheelbase, short wheelbase, and it tends to be one or the other. So in terms of wheelbase, the wheelbase is now restricted to 3.6 metres, which is short by current F1 regulations, but you know, not, not that short in real terms. So Mercedes will make to, they need to make their car a bit shorter. Then we come to rake, and there's two aspects that will matter here. First of all, as we said before, the, the underfloor, these big underfloor tunnels, what people are kind of terming ground effect tunnels, they um, are quite restrictive in the geometry in which you can have them. So if you can't get that airflow to work in those shapes at high rake, then you can't have high rake. Now, I don't know if that is the case or not. I don't have a wind tunnel and the ability to test these things. However, if you can run higher rake with the new car, you actually get a potential benefit. Around the rear brake ducts, you have this big vein that hangs down, almost a bit like a, not quite as low as a skirt on a, a, an 80s wing car, but you have a really good piece of bodywork there, which will help seal the back of the diffuser. Now, at higher rakes, that will actually sit lower than the diffuser itself, which actually means that you're kind of sealing that diffuser far better if you get more rake. So there is a potential for people still to want very high rake with these cars if, as I say, the geometry under four allows you to get into that position already. So you will see some variation in those areas and how teams play about with that aspect of it is going to be quite interesting yeah. in those first weeks. I mean, just you saying that reminds me Peter Wright, who until quite recently has been a part of the FAA uh, development programs and of course famously was with Colin Chapman when they realised the effect of sliding skirts, was saying not so long ago, whilst these new rigs were being formulated, that the solution is to go back to 
sliding skirts. Now that's obviously not happening <laughs> because I think they did a lot of damage to the racetracks apart from anything else, but anyway, it's not happening. But let's get back to the real point though about these new cars, because they are in effect the result of surveys with the fans which have said we want more overtaking, these cars are impossible. And in theory, the 22 car is designed around the concept of being easier to follow, easier to overtake with. Is that, that's correct? Yeah, right? that is it. For the for probably the first time that they've actually really done a set of regulations yeah. purely to look at that, but also, you know, in looking at like, the regulations in a much wider perspective, it's probably only 2009 where there was that limited wind tunnel program funded by the teams as part of the overtaking working group, but that was never followed up. Every other rule change has been very much, you know, stick your finger in the air, which way do we want to go with these rules? And it's been well, there was Typically. that one where Bernie said he wanted six seconds a lap faster, wasn't it? Forget about overtaking, just wanted the car yes, much quicker. Yes, for Pat example, Simmons yes. Driven one, yeah. Um, you know, the, the regulations have never really been properly um, worked out and then proven by a no. set of engineers and simulation tools and wind tunnels and what have you. So, under that heading, front wing, what do you think of the front wing? How, how restrictive is it in terms of what you can do with design? And is it going to have the effect of allowing a car to follow another one more closely? Yes, the front wheel is quite interesting um, in that they've taken away some of the um, tools that the aerodynamicists have in getting that wing to work with the rest of the car. So the front wing end plates, they've got these lovely sail shaped triangular end plates now that are very restricted in the angle that they can be in and you know, the position they can be in. So that's going to make life really difficult for the engineers. Um, equally, at the moment where the front wing comes in and then there's that middle 50 centimetres of the front wing where you have this neutral section mm -hmm. which kicks off this Y250 vortex which we've spoken so much yep. about. That is one of the biggest issues that's creating a wake behind the car. It's the outwash from the front wing end plates and the outwash from the um, Y250 oh. uh, intersection. So the new wing is simpler at the end plates and now all four, four elements have to merge all the way in to the nose cone. So you won't have this neutral sector section and there's no way of you kicking mm. up a big complicated Y250 vortex. So that should improve things. Equally, you could then say, well, that's creating lots of other problems for the teams to manage the front tire wake. So the FIA have actually preempted that and have made two or three key changes to the uh, front wheel area to actually help get that tire wake, which is the, again, the big issue for the following car, all this dirty wake coming off of the open spinning tires. So you can see that we now have the wheel fairings that will spin with the tires rather than the static ones that we probably remember back from 2009. We know we've got some of the cars here with those on. And then you will have what they're calling the tire fin, which is this fin that comes up over the tire and actually extends down inside the tire. And I call them the Lotus 7 mudguards, actually, but anyway. Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably, uh, probably a touch more complicated than Colin Chapman <laughs> focused on. Now, these, um, this bodywork around the wheel is all what's something quite new to form, and it's called prescribed components, which means the design of them in terms of the shape is almost wholly restricted and set out in CAD files by the FA. So the teams can't play about with these and make mm. massively complex tire fins and uh, brake duct fins. But what they do is actually manage the front tire wake really effectively. So it stops the front tire wake upsetting the front wing, it stops the tire wake being sucked back into the car, and it also with the uh, wheel fairing, uh, will actually cuts the, the wake of the tire in the first place. So they've been very careful here. And this is why these regulations are so well thought through, is that if you look at one piece in isolation, you think, well, that maybe is a negative step. When you see what they've done downstream, you can see that they've already started to counter some of these problems.